Well, will you bow your heads with me, friends? Heavenly Father, I pray that that prayer would be answered in each of our lives, that we would know you better. Lord, you made us, you died to save us, and you want to spend eternity with each of us. And so, Lord, I pray that each of us would respond to your loving heart tonight. And may your Holy Spirit, Lord, sharpen our minds and bring us into a close walk with you. As we study your word tonight, Lord, I pray that you will bring us up higher in our relationship with you and that what we learn tonight will help us um, be closer to you in our relationship. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you, uh, I asked you this before, I mean, how many of you have been on a jury before? Okay, wow, you must have a lot of, a lot of things going on in Oregon for that many of you to be jurors. Okay, so, uh, you know, one of the things that you may remember the judge telling you is that during the trial that you were to keep an open mind and not to form any conclusions before the evidence had been all presented. Do you, do you remember instructions, such, something like that? I want to encourage you, because what we're going to present tonight is actually going to be the first of, of kind of two presentations, okay? So, uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll see that these presentations we're doing in this seminar kind of build upon each other as we go, and they're, they're all interconnected, really. But some are more directly connected than others. So tomorrow night will be kind of the second half of what we do tonight. Uh, our presentation is entitled The Missing Text. And so um, I want to encourage you uh, to come back tomorrow to hear the second half and to not form any opinions till you've heard uh, what we're going to be presenting. We're going to actually be looking at the greatest cover-up in religious history tomorrow night. So our presentation tonight is entitled Prophecy's Day of Hope. Am I doing something to mess up the sound? No? Okay. What about this antenna? Where does it need to be at? It's okay? All right. Um, Prophecy's Day of Hope. So I want to begin with an interesting story that occurred a number of years ago. One day, uh, a Russian czar was actually walking through a park. And kind of toward the back of the park, he noticed that there was a sentry standing guard. And he wondered what this, guard, this sentry was doing there in the park. And so he kind of wondered out loud. And the sentry said, you know, sir, I have no idea, your majesty, um, what, why I'm supposed to be here. But every day I come here and guard this part of the park. And the czar said, you mean we're spending state money and you have no idea what you're guarding? I'm going to have to look into this. So he began to do his research. And what he discovered was that over 100 years before, Catherine the Great had been given a rose bush for her birthday. And so that the rose bush wouldn't be trampled and killed, she had ordered a soldier to come stand guard over the rose. And every day the order was transferred in the ledger for the next day. And so this tradition had continued for a century. The rose bush had long since died, but you still had soldiers guarding this part of the park and they didn't even know what they were guarding. They were standing guard over a mere tradition, something simply down, passed down by the hand of man. I wonder if it's possible that a man-made tradition has slipped into the Christian church a tradition whose foundations we really haven't examined. Now you'll recall that previously, when we looked at the little horn of Daniel 7, the Antichrist power, one of the important characteristics of this power is that it would think to change God's times and laws. So an important question I want to ask tonight is, what part of God's law deals with time? Let's actually go to the fourth commandment tonight, the fourth of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 8 through 11. This is actually the longest commandment, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. This is on page 81 of the Seminar Bible. As we learned Monday night, the Ten Commandments are still in effect, aren't they? 
and they're important to God, so they should be important to us. These are 10 rules for living that are actually based on love and for our own good. So let's take a look at the fourth commandment, the commandment really having to do with worship. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Praise the Lord. We have a God who likes to give us a day off. A friend of mine calls this a daycation. Thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So this is the fourth commandment having to do with a day of worship falling on the seventh day of the week. Now, why do you think Satan would work so hard to actually change the Sabbath? Well, what does it represent? What does it symbolize? Let's take a look at Exodus 31. Exodus 31, 13. Exodus 31, verse 13. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So this important symbol has something to do with God sanctifying us. Verse 16, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, so this is telling us that the Sabbath has something to do with God being the creator and making the world in six days. Now, who are the children of Israel today? It's just something that just applies to the Jews. Remember, we gave out a little uh, booklet last weekend called Spiritual Israel. I hope you had a chance to read it. Did anybody not get that booklet? Okay. Um, do, we, do we still have some? Let's check on that because if not, I have a, I have a little secret stash. I want to make sure you all get one, okay? If you didn't get one, come see me afterwards, and I'll make sure you get a copy, okay? It's a very important booklet. But the fact of the matter is, Israel today is anybody that follows Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how we can be grafted into Abraham without being of Abraham's seed, as the Bible says. Okay? So this still applies to us today. And notice the Bible says that this covenant and this sign regarding the Sabbath is a perpetual covenant. Now, what does the word perpetual mean? Non-stop, non never ending, never changing, right? So it still applies to us today. So really what we're reading in these verses is that the Sabbath is a symbol for both creation as well as recreation or redemption. Because fallen man needs to be recreated, isn't that right? And we all struggle with that fallen nature, that sinful nature that tries to have the power in our life. It's a daily struggle, isn't it? But Jesus asks us to... to uh, receive the victory through him as we get to know him better. And so if you think about it, the Sabbath being connected to creation and redemption or salvation. So how is an attack on the Sabbath really an attack on Jesus? Well, who died to save us? Jesus did. And who created us in the first place? Did you know that Jesus was actively the one that created us? John 1, let's take a look, and I want to show you a couple of passages, although there's more, uh, that show that Jesus is our creator. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, and this is a great book, John, the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not a God, but God, right? So whoever the word is, is it clear that he's God? Yeah. Or part of the Godhead? Yes. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, 
and without him was not anything made that was made. So is the, whoever the word is, is he, is he the creator according to these first three verses? Yeah, he made everything, right? And then if you go to verse 14, it tells us who the word is. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So who is the word that, was be, that uh, lived among us? Jesus, right? So put these verses together, and it's very clear that Jesus, the word, is the one that created us. We find this also in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, starting in verse 1, or 13, I'm sorry. Colossians 1, 13, the Bible says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? Maybe you're dealing with darkness in your life tonight. Maybe you're being harassed by the powers of darkness. Well, you know what? The Bible promises victory over that. Jesus has delivered us and will deliver us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Verse 16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So who's the creator? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Imagine um, all these things in the world were made by Jesus. We, we have a very creative God, don't we? And I... I think I've asked this before. How many of you have been scuba diving? Okay. Well, quite a few of you. Um, it's amazing what you can see under the water. Uh, all the wildlife. I just want to show you a few pictures just to illustrate the incredible creative power of Jesus. Um, this was just on one particular dive. A friend of mine actually had some fancy underwater camera equipment. I don't, but... So I was on this dive, but he was the one taking the pictures. Just a, just a little bit of illustration on how incredibly creative Jesus is. And so this is a beautiful little eel that's blue and yellow. And then these are uh, little nudibranchs that shimmer in the, in the light. This is, anybody know what kind of fish this is? Lionfish, right. Do you want to get close to those? No, they're very poisonous. They're, they're uh, what do you call those things? Their spines are very poisonous. This is a little box fish, very creative. I think this is a lobster. It's like he's, look like he's out of this world, doesn't he? Here was an octopus that we found, and one of the friends I was with kept kind of uh, chasing him, and it's amazing how they, they can hide in such small holes. And then another fish that was really pretty, a blue fish. We serve a very creative, very creative God. Going back to this picture I like to show quite frequently, you know, we've spent time looking at some very important parts of Jesus' ministry, haven't we, during these meetings? We saw that Jesus came as the sacrifice right on time when we studied Daniel chapter 9. And we saw that he is our high priest right now, serving as our mediator in heaven during the judgment. And then we saw that Jesus is coming soon as the, as the king to take us home. But where did it all begin? It began at creation. And that's what we'll really be talking about tonight. Jesus and creation. Now, when was the Sabbath made? When did it first come about? Did it first come through the Jews? And did it stop with the Jews? Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Actually, when you go to the very beginning, you find the Sabbath there. Now, what's Genesis 1 all about? It's about creation. It's about crea Jesus creating the world in six days. And then we come to Genesis 2. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Did God rest because he was tired? 
Why did he rest? That just means he ceased from his work. Like when a lawyer says, I rest my case, that just means I'm done presenting evidence, even though you, you may be very tired, but what you really mean is I'm done. I'm done. And it says, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because the, in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So in other words, he set aside the seventh day and gave it a special blessing that only that day has. And he made it holy. What does the word sanctify mean? Make holy and to set aside something for a holy purpose, a special purpose. And so that's what, that's what, that's what God did. Imagine that first Sabbath. What was that like? God had already made Adam and Eve. And here you have Jesus being able to spend that first Sabbath day with his new creation, including the ones made in his image, mankind. Oh, that would have been wonderful to have been there. Now, you know, it's interesting when you look at the earth's relationship to the sun and the moon. Uh, there's a lesson to be learned about the Sabbath, even with that and about the truth of the Bible and creation. So what happens to the earth every 365 days? It goes around the sun, right? It does one complete rotation around the sun. That's how we get our year. What happens to the earth every 30 days or thereabouts? The moon does a complete rotation around the earth. That's where we get our month from. What happens to the earth every 24 hours? The earth turns on its axis, does a complete uh, turn on its axis, right? That's where we get our day from. So we know where we get our year, month, and day from. It has to do with the earth's relationship with the sun or the moon. Now, what happens to the earth every seven days in terms of its relationship with other heavenly bodies? Nothing. So the question is, where do we, where do we get our week from? It comes from God at the very beginning during creation. You know, if you believe in the Bible, you know where the week came from. It's been with us from the very beginning of the creation of this world. But if you don't believe in the Bible, you have no explanation for the seven-day week that's kept universally. Now, during the French Revolution, my understanding is they tried to, to erase all memory of God and the Bible. They were burnt out on religion from all the horrors of the Dark Ages. And so they actually created a 10-day week. Imagine, you think your weekend, it takes too long to get to your weekends now. Imagine a 10-day week. I don't know why they didn't make it a shorter week, but they made it a longer week. But it, they realized it didn't work. And they went back to the seven-day week. And one of the reasons it didn't work is because the animals refused to work. Because even they are on a weekly cycle. So let's review what happened during creation. I've kind of made it fairly easy with the pictures on the slide. But what happened during the first six days of creation? Um, Jesus made the earth. Um, what was created on the first day? Light. Second day? The air or firmament, okay, where he separated the waters. So we have the sky above, the waters below. The third day? Land, land right? Where he separated the land and the water, and he filled the land with vegetation, trees and plants. What about the fourth day? The sun, the moon, and the stars. The fifth day? Fish and birds, very good. And then the sixth day? Animals, land animals, and man, okay? And um, he ended with the best. Mankind. Now, why are we the best? Because we're made in the image of God. You know, I used to mentor at-risk youth. In fact, one of them just called, what, yesterday to tell me he was back in jail. It's a, you know, it's a lifelong process. But anyway, uh, I remember taking Junior to church one day. And uh, keep in mind, a few weeks before this, I had taught him about the creation account. If you grew up in a Christian home learning the word of God, what a blessing. Some people don't have that privilege. They know nothing about the Bible. He had never even heard of Adam and Eve. 
He had no idea how, why we were here or if we had any purpose in this life. So it was a joy to teach him the creation story. And um, while we were going through this, I said, Junior, did God make dogs in his image? He said, yes. I said, no, he didn't. He only made man in his image. I said, that's why you shouldn't say dog to your friends. Because I noticed he and his, his group home friends, would, they'd call each other dog. They'd say, hey, dog, hey, fool. So anyway, a couple weeks later, I'm taking Junior to church with one of the other kids from the group home, Jesus. And Jesus made the mistake of calling Junior a dog. And he says, quit calling me a dog. I was made in the image of God. I said, yes, he, he's learning, he's learning. So I have a question for you. Why did God make the birds and the fish on the fifth day and man and the other animals were on the sixth day? Have you ever wondered that before? Did God just run out of time on the fifth day? Is this just an arbitrary division of animals? Why? Anybody have an answer to that? Okay. Um, let me just give you my own theory on this, see what you think of this. You know, the Bible says that God formed the earth and then he filled it. And the first three days of creation, God formed the earth. And then the last three days, he filled it. And he filled it in the same order that he formed it. So on the first day, he created light. And on the fourth day, he filled the heavens with lights. Are you with me so far? On the second day, he separated the waters, made the sky. And on the fifth day, he filled those waters with birds above and fish below. On the third day, he created the land and the vegetation. And then on the sixth day, he filled it with land, animals, and of course, man is the crowning act of creation. So see, God doesn't do anything arbitrarily, does he? And then on the seventh day, he said, I want to make a complete week and I want to make a special day that commemorates everything I've done, which was perfect and good. And for all time, I'm going to set aside this day as a special day so that people remember that I'm their creator. You know, someone has remarked that if man had been consistent in keeping the Sabbath, there'd be no atheists today. Because we would remember where we come from and who made us. That's what the Sabbath is about. But we do have atheists today, right? And a lot of people that believe in evolution. What, what about this idea of evolution versus a creator? <clears throat> Anybody here ever been to Mount Rushmore? Okay. Do you believe that Mount Rushmore came about through evolution? It's amazing what wind and pressure and water will do in over time, isn't it? These heads are 60 feet high. Their noses are 20 feet long. Their mouths are about 18 feet wide. So don't, anybody, don't let someone tell you you have a big mouth, okay? At least it's not 18 feet wide. And their, their eyes 11 feet across. It took Gutzon Borglum and 400 workers 14 years to blast out thank you so much, to blast out 800 million pounds of rock to create these images. And of course, when you get closer to them, it becomes more and more obvious that someone created these heads. They didn't just appear through evolution and disintegration of rock. This is uh, interesting. Newsweek magazine reported this in 1979, all the way back then. This article was called The Secrets of the Human Cell. This is what it said. Imagine, if you will, downtown New York City during rush hour. Subways racing, elevators whizzing up and down skyscrapers, cabs idling in traffic, people buzzing around in the streets and in the buildings. From 10 stories below street level to 180 stories above, it's a dynamo of activity and a complex network of electrical, water, gas, and telecommunication systems. But according to even most evolutionary scientists, one single human cell of life is staggeringly more complex than New York City rush hour. 
Each of these 100 trillion cells functions like a walled city. Power plants generate the cell's energy. Factories produce proteins, vital units of chemical commerce. Complex transportation systems guide specific chemicals from point to point within the cell. Sentries monitor the outside world for signs of danger. Disciplined biological armies stand ready to grapple with invaders. A centralized genetic government maintains order. And so we are so much more complex than these simple faces carved out of Mount Rushmore. Isn't that right? It's obvious we have a maker, a creator. And the Sabbath is to help us to remember that. So what day is the Bible Sabbath? If you go to a regular encyclopedia or dictionary, it will tell you the answer. This is from the World Book Encyclopedia. Sabbath, it comes on Saturday, the seventh day of the week. In contrast, the dictionary will tell you that Sunday is the first day of the week. Call this because in ancient times it was a day for the worship of the sun. Now, does anybody here speak Spanish? Okay. Yeah. What's the word for Saturday in Spanish? Sabado. Okay. Actually, in over 140 languages in the world, the word for the seventh day of the week or Saturday is the word Sabbath in their language. Spanish is a good example of that, but also Russian is like that as well. Um, Sabato. Now, what about German? Does anybody here speak German? Wait a minute. You told me the other night that a lot of you have German ethnicity, okay? So in, in German, what's the, does anybody know what the word is for Wednesday? Mitvok, okay? And what does that mean, David? Middle of the week. That's exactly what it means, okay? The only way Wednesday could be the middle of the week is if you start with Sunday as the first day of the week. So you have three days before Wednesday and three days after. So before you have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then the middle of the week. And then after Wednesday, you have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the seventh day of the week. Now, someone once wrote into the U.S. Naval Observatory and asked if there's ever been a change in the continuity of the weekly cycle. Because, you know, there are experts at astronomy there and they can tell what's happened for th several thousand years just through the movement of the stars. And they confirmed there's never been a change in the continuity of the weekly cycle. Now, let's go to the Bible to answer this question. What day of the week is the seventh day? And we can learn about this even through the death of Christ. The events surrounding the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Luke twenty three fifty two. You know, knowing that Jesus is our creator makes his death on Calvary all the more mind-blowing, doesn't it? This wasn't just a human that died for another human. This was the creator of the universe coming to lay down his life for you. That makes you pretty special. Luke twenty three fifty two. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. So Jesus has just died. And he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a sepulcher. That's a, that's a grave that was hewn in stone, wherein never a man before was laid. And that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. So what day did Jesus die on? The Bible calls it the preparation day. And the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after they beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandments. So when Jesus died, there were these ladies that loved him. They wanted to give him a proper burial, but that was a lot of work to embalm a body. And so what interrupted their work? Keeping the Sabbath, resting for the Sabbath. Luke 24, verse 1 says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. They found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Aren't you thankful they didn't find his body? Yes. 
This is the only founder of a major world religion who's not in the tomb today. The reason they didn't find his body is he had resurrected on the first day of the week. So they rested on the Sabbath and then they came back at the earliest opportunity after the Sabbath was over. They come back on the first day of the week to finish the job that they had been interrupted. So let's review the order of events that we just read. What does the Bible call the day Jesus died? The preparation day. And then what was the day that Jesus rose? First day of the week. And by the way, even though Luke doesn't directly say Jesus rose on the first day of the week, Mark 16, 9 directly tells us he did rise the first day of the week. I mean, it's kind of implied in Luke, but Mark 16, 9 directly says it. So now what do many Christians call the day Jesus died today? Good, Good Friday. And what do they call the day Jesus rose? Easter Sunday, right? Um, do you hear any debates about whether he really rose on Sunday or not? No, it, it's pretty clear. And so what's the day between Friday and Sunday, the day he rested in the tomb? It's called Sabbath in the Bible, and today we call that word Saturday. Okay? You know, it's interesting. Jesus rested after creating the world in six days, and the one day he rested in the tomb was also the Sabbath day. Do you think that was a coincidence? No. Or was that by divine design? It was divine design, right? Yeah. And you know, something else that's interesting is the fact that Jesus' body did not see corruption over the day of rest. You know, back in the Old Testament, one of the ways that God taught the Jews about the Sabbath was through the miracle of the manna that would fall six days and every day it would fall from heaven. This was heavenly bread, heavenly wafers that tasted like honey. And how often were the Jews supposed to collect that manna? Every morning before the sun came out, right? And they were only to collect enough for that day. Except on Friday, they were supposed to collect a double portion. Because it was supposed to last over the Sabbath. They weren't to go work on Sabbath. God wanted to give them truly a day of rest. Now, what would happen if they collected a double portion of manna on a day other than Friday? The manna would rot. The manna would rot, okay? But it wouldn't rot over the Sabbath. You know, Jesus is compared to living manna. I mean, he, he's compared to manna. He's called living manna or the living bread. And it's interesting, just like the manna didn't, doesn't corrupt over the Sabbath, Jesus' body didn't suffer corruption over the Sabbath either. And so we can learn that the Sabbath was on the day between Friday and Sunday from the events surrounding the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, while Jesus was actually alive, did he keep the Sabbath here on this earth? Let's take a look at Luke 4.16. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Was Jesus someone that was an occasional churchgoer? Luke 4, 16 says, He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. So Jesus was a habitual churchgoer on Sabbath. Isn't that right? Now, what did Jesus actually teach about the Sabbath? If we go to Mark 2, 27 and 28, this is Jesus speaking now, speaking about the Sabbath, part of the, his law, the fourth commandment. And he says this, He said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, which really puts the Sabbath in its proper context the only reason the Sabbath is meaningful is because it's about a relationship with our Creator. Amen? Amen? So if Jesus hadn't have made us, there wouldn't be a need for the Sabbath. Our relationship is that important to Him. And really, the Sabbath illustrates the importance of that relationship because what it really is is a day where He wants to spend time with us where he wants to create, recreate, reconnect with his people. 
It's a very special day. Verse 28 says, Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So who's the Lord of the Sabbath? Jesus. Jesus is. And if someone's the Lord, aren't they the one that gets to tell us when to keep it? And how to keep it? Yeah. Because a lot of people think, well, I get to choose what day the Sabbath is. And then you're actually, in a way, kind of making yourself Lord of the Sabbath. But Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm sorry, I didn't even get to that slide where we're looking up the verse. Notice what Jesus also said in Matthew 24, 20. Jesus was looking, looking ahead to when Jerusalem would be destroyed. And he said to his followers in Matthew 24, 20, he says, But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now, when was Jerusalem destroyed? It was surrounded by the Roman armies and destroyed by Titus, the Roman emperor, in A.D. 70. Why would Jesus encourage his disciples to pray that their flight not be on the Sabbath if at that time they wouldn't be keeping it? Because a lot of times people say that the Sabbath ended with the death of Christ. But almost 40 years later, he still knew that his followers would be keeping it. Isn't that right? Jesus also said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Which of the Ten Commandments do you think Christ was referring to there? All of them. Do you think he was giving a 10% discount on the Ten Commandments? Remember, the commandments are for our good, right? And also, they're perfect and unchangeable and eternal. What about the early Christian church? Did they keep the Sabbath? Let's take a look at a few examples in Acts 13 and Acts 18. Acts 13, verses 42 and 44. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, so that's their church, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next day. Is that what the Bible says? On Sunday? No, it says that they would be, the words would be preached to them the next Sabbath. Verse 44, and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. So Jews and Gentiles were worshiping on what day? The Sabbath. The Sabbath. What about Acts 18.4? Acts 18.4, the Bible says, speaking of Paul, it says he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Acts 16, 13, even when they weren't in church, it says, On the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made or customary to be made. Actually, when you look closely at the book of Acts, you'll find that Paul held over 84 meetings on the Sabbath. Most of them are found in Acts chapter 18. But Acts 13, 16, 17, 18, 19 all record Sabbaths where Paul was preaching uh, in the synagogue. Now, who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. Okay. Sometimes we think Paul, but it's actually Luke. Okay. And was Luke a Gentile or a Jew? He was a Gentile. And sometimes in the book of Luke, he'll refer to, or the book of Acts, he'll refer to things as being of the Jews, like the synagogue of the Jews. But you know, nowhere does he ever call the Sabbath the Sabbath of the Jews. In fact, nowhere does the Bible refer to, to the Sabbath as the Sabbath of the Jews. It's, remember, what did Jesus say? The Sabbath was made for who? Man. Not, he didn't say the Jews, he said for man. Don't you think if it's good for a Jew, it's good for all of us? And by the way, um, at the time of creation, were there any Jews here on the earth? They came through Abraham about 2,500 years later, right? Now let's go to a New Testament book that confirms the existence and, and perpetuity of the Sabbath. Hebrews 4, verse 4.
Sometimes people are told that the New Testament doesn't really confirm the Sabbath like it does other commandments. But I find otherwise. Hebrews actually does confirm it. And let me ask you a question. Would the New Testament even need to confirm it for it to still be in existence? For instance, uh, I don't know what your code section is against murder in the state of Oregon, but I can tell you in California, it's 187. Uh, they don't have to keep re, re, uh, mm, legislating that law every year. Until it's repealed, it remains in effect. The Sabbath also remains in effect. But notice the New Testament does confirm it. Hebrews 4.4, 4, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. Which day? The seventh day. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Verse 9 says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now sometimes people that keep the Sabbath are accused of being legalists. You're works oriented. You're trying to work your way to heaven. Did you know that actually keeping the Sabbath is just the opposite? Because as we're reading here, one of the things that the Sabbath represents is that we can't earn our salvation. It represents ceasing from our own works. It's actually a symbol of that Jesus is the one that saves us, not ourselves. So who actually changed the Bible Sabbath? Because don't most Christians worship on Sunday today? Did God change the Sabbath? The Bible says, for I am the Lord, I change not. Did Jesus change the Sabbath? Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? You know, if you closely examine the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you won't find any verses that actually change the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. And in all fairness, tomorrow night, we're actually going to examine all the texts in the Bible and the New Testament that talk about the first day of the week. There's eight first day texts in the Bible. We're going to closely look at all of those to see what the Bible really says about Sunday, the first day of the week. So who does the Bible actually prophesy would attempt to change God's law? The little horn, right? The little horn would think to change times and laws. So I'm going to direct you to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. You can buy these in a regular Catholic store today or many Christian bookstores. This, and, you know, they teach doctrine, their Catholic doctrine, through questions and answers. So here's what you would find in a convert's catechism. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Which may surprise some of you that it's right in there. So what would be the next logical question? Why are we worshiping on Sunday, right? So here's the, here's the next question. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Sabbath? Qu answer, because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Who gave them that right to do that? Nobody from above, right? This is a very famous cardinal, James Gibbons. From Faith of Our Fathers, he said, You may read the Bible from Genesis, Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. Here's another Catholic priest, Father Enright. He said, there is but one church on the face of the earth which has the power or claims power. I'm glad he added that last sec uh, part, claims power, to make laws binding on the conscience, binding before God, binding under the penalty of hellfire. For instance, the institution of Sunday. What right has any other church to keep this day? You answer by virtue of the third commandment, which they're really referring to the fourth commandment, which says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. But Sunday is not the Sabbath. Any schoolboy knows that Sunday is the first day of the week. I have repeatedly offered $1,000 to anyone who will prove by the Bible alone that Sunday is the day we are to keep and no one has called for the money. It was the holy Catholic Church that changed the day of rest from Saturday, the seventh day of the week, to Sunday, the first day of the week. Friends, let me tell you something. Remember, we identified this particular power 
as being a power that would try to take the place of Christ. And one of the ways that you try to take the place of Christ is you try to undermine his law, specifically part of the law having to do with him as our creator. This was actually a masterful plan to undermine Jesus. And so when you start to put these pieces together, you realize, wow, this is pretty, this is very significant. Now, many Christians believe that we keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection. So what's wrong with that? Is that what we, we should do? Um, two things on that point, on that question. Number one, do, does the Bible tell us that we honor the resurrection through Sunday worship? It never tells us to do that. There's no text on that. But secondly, how are we supposed to honor the resurrection of Christ? Does the Bible tell us how we honor the resurrection of Jesus? Actually, in Romans 6, we are told how to honor the resurrection of Jesus, and it's actually through baptism. Baptism, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So baptism actually represents a death, of the old man of sin and burial of that old man and then resurrection to a new life in Christ. That's how we honor the resurrection of Jesus, according to the Bible, is through baptism. What about the expression, the Lord's Day? I only know of one verse in the Bible that mentions the Lord's Day. Let's turn to that verse, Revelation 1.10. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. This is John speaking. He says, I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And God revealed to him the information that came into the book of Revelation. Now, what day was he referring to when he said the Lord's day? The Bible doesn't say whether it's the seventh day of the week, the first day of the week, right? But remember, what did Jesus say? The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. That's the Lord's day is the Sabbath. This verse doesn't say anything about the first day of the week. Here's another important question. Will we keep the Sabbath on the earth made new? Do you have proof of that? Let's look at Isaiah 66. You know, they, they call Isaiah the little Bible. Like the Bible has 66 books. Isaiah has 66 chapters. And... A lot of it is kind of, kind of thematic, like the Bible is. Just like the Bible ends by talking about the new earth, so does Isaiah. Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. The Bible says this, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so, sh so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Now think about this. Did Adam and Eve keep the Sabbath at the beginning of time? Yes. Jesus instituted it at creation, right? All the patriarchs were keeping the Sabbath. Then along, you know, 2,500 years later, comes along the Jewish nation. They obviously were keeping the Sabbath. And they still honor the Sabbath today, right? Which is another way we can know when the, when Saturday, or the Sabbath is. Because it's been something that this group of people have been, been honoring for thousands of years. So unless they all overslept a day, we know what day the Sabbath is. Um, Jesus kept the Sabbath. His followers kept the Sabbath. And we'll be keeping the Sabbath on the new earth. So why would our generation be any different than all these other groups? Don't you think if we're going to be keeping the Sabbath for all of eternity, we should be doing it now yeah. and get started now? Now, does it really matter what day we keep? 
If it didn't matter, would God have been so specific in the fourth commandment? Wouldn't it, if, if it really didn't matter, wouldn't he say something like, remember a Sabbath day? Pick one out of seven. But he was very specific. He said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you should do all your labor, but the seven days is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. You know, one day I was talking to one of my colleagues when I was a DA in Riverside. And she said that, you know, she, she was going to church on Sunday and she said, you know, it really doesn't matter what day you worship God. You worship on Saturday, I worship on Sunday. The main thing is that you worship God. And that sounds pretty good at first, but until you start thinking about it. And so I said, Dina, let me ask you a question. And by the way, she was on Amazon Survivor, if you've ever seen that show. She was one of the contestants. Anyway, so she, um, I said, Dina, let me ask you a question. I said, did it matter what tree Adam and Eve ate from in the Garden of Eden? She said, yes. And I said, why did it matter? She goes, quit cross-examining me. <laughs> I said, Dina, why did it matter that they ate from a tree God said no? They said, she said, because they disobeyed God. I said, you know what? It's the same issue when it comes to the day of worship. It's really not about trees or days. It's about honoring your creator and your Lord. That's the issue, the authority of God. And then later I thought, man, this is what I should have said. And I totally, I blew it. So the next time I talked to her, have you ever done that? Where you're like, later you thought, this is what I should have said. So later on, I said, Dina, I have a question for you. I says, when the judge tells you to be in court on Monday at 830, when do you show up? She said, it depends on the judge. <laughs> I said, what about Judge Morgan? She says, I get there early because Judge Morgan, he's retired, but back then he was like, he'd call you out for being a minute late. Some judges, they don't care if you get there by noon, which can be kind of frustrating if you're the other party waiting for them to show up. So I kind of appreciate Judge Morgan, very timely judge. But um, he cared about time. So time does matter to a judge, right? I says, well, Dina, if you'll come to court on time for Judge Morgan, an earthly judge, how much more should you honor the God of the universe? I mean, think about it. If you had a case where you were on trial and on Friday the judge said, okay, I'm going to release you on your own recognizance. You're a free person, but I'm going to order you to come back to court on Monday at 830. Would you tell the judge, well, I'm not coming until Tuesday? If you did that, wouldn't it be completely disrespectful to the, to the authority of the court? And if you did that, the judge would say, well, I, I can make sure you'll be here at Monday at 8.30. You're spending the weekend in jail, right? Really, this has to do with who's in control around here? Whose authority do we respect? And who has our heart, really? That's what it's all about. Now, speaking of legal analogies... Is it clear when a law is repealed? Now, I don't know. In Oregon, is it illegal to talk on your cell phone while you're driving the car? Okay. Did you know about it before they made the law? Before it took effect, did you hear about it in the news? You were on pretty good notice, right? I know in California, that's the way it was. It didn't just happen one day and then you start getting cited for that. It was all over the news. Now, what if I told you be very careful when you're driving home tonight because they just switched the law on what side of the road we drive on in America. We finally saw the light. The English really do have a better system. You'd think I was crazy, right? If I'm the only one you've heard it from and this is the first time, you'd be like, right? It would be so clear. It would be so obvious. Listen, what we're talking about tonight is something serious. This is one of the commandments of God. Part of the Ten Commandments. If God really was going to change his, his law having to do with worship, wouldn't he make it so plain in Scripture? Yes. Now, first of all, it doesn't make sense that God would change his own law because his law is perfect. 
that he would have to repeal his law. But if he chose to, wouldn't he make it so plain in the Bible? Because if we're going to disregard one of the commandments, we need to have a very good reason to do so, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Not just the traditions of man from a church that we see fulfills the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. Now, what if you're one of those people that say, well, as long as I keep the other nine commandments, I'm okay. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. So we're held accountable for what we know. Isn't that right? Let me show you another verse in James to encourage you because I don't want anyone here tonight to feel condemned if you didn't know anything about the seven-day Sabbath before. You know, the Bible says God winks in times of ignorance. But of course, the rest of that verse is, but now he's calling all men to repent. So James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So implied in that is if you didn't know any better, God winks. He doesn't condemn you for what you honestly didn't know. Sometimes people say, man, I wish I hadn't come tonight. Because now I know. But do we really want to be those Christians that close our ears to new truth? Close our eyes and say, I, did, I pretend I didn't hear that. The people Winston Churchill described that they hurry on about their business when they hear truth as if nothing had happened. We don't want to be that person, do we? Shouldn't we always embrace new light? Yeah. Amen. You know, Jesus isn't going to keep giving us new light if we close our ears to the light he's already given us. Now, in the book of Revelation, in describing God's last day people, it describes them as, as those that keep the commandments of God. Don't you think that includes all Ten Commandments? Now, why am I speaking so much about the Fourth Commandment tonight? It's because this is the one that has been forgotten. And isn't it interesting that of all the Ten Commandments, only one begins with the word remember. It's this commandment. Because God knew we would forget. Here's a picture of my family. Uh, when I say my family, it's my grandma in the middle, my two sisters on either side of her, and then my nieces and nephews. And uh, this was at my sister's graduation from police academy. Anyway, you know, I lived about from 1992 to 2000, to the year 2000, I lived really close to my grandmother in Southern California. And for about the first three of those years, we got together here and there, but not very regularly. I don't know just how we happened upon this, this custom, but from about 95 to 2000, I started going to my grandma's on Thursday nights. Uh, it was a night where, that I chose because uh, you know, I would usually be there during the week. And I didn't have a lot going on usually in court on Friday. So I figured Thursday would be a good night where I could, because I, I worked a lot of hours during the week but in evenings, but Thursdays was a pretty safe night. So I said, Grandma, let's start having, and so my grandma would make dinner for me on Thursday nights. So I'd go over to her apartment at six o'clock and she'd have dinner ready. Once in a while I'd take her out, but usually she cooked for me. She was a really good cook. She had a couple of restaurants in her life and she would make a great meal and we'd, we'd spend two hours together. And she would tell me all about my family history. And I just, we just had a great time, just her and I. And I usually got stuck doing the dishes, just like I did in her restaurant. It was the first job where I was a W-2 employee at 10 years old. I was making a dollar an hour. So I guess I kept that habit up. And I would wash the dishes. But we had a great time. And um, you know, because it was a weekly ritual or habit, it was actually nice because we didn't have to figure out how to make time in our busy schedule for each other because Thursday was her night. So my, when I, you know, hanging out with my friends, they knew Thursday night was grandma's night. I didn't plan other things that night. And um, those were great times. And when I moved away in 2000, my grandma didn't even last a year. 
I was her only close family member in the area, and when I moved away, she didn't last very long. She was very lonely. But you know, I think there's a lesson in this little story about my grandma with regard to the Sabbath. Just like my grandma and I love to spend time with each other, Jesus loves to spend time with us. And he knows we're busy. And we're, we're doing, you know, most of us are doing very profitable, legitimate things during the week. But God knows that we're creatures of habit. And so to, to, for us to spend time with him, he knew he would need to tell us this is the way it is, you know? I think if God had just said, made it a suggestion, and if he'd have said, hey, when you find extra time, give me some extra time, please, we probably wouldn't be giving him much time, isn't that right? But the fact that he made it a special day every week, and because it's a commandment, we don't have to argue or worry about whether we should do it or not. It's there. You know what I'm saying? When I was working as the DA, I loved the Sabbath. Because I could work 10 days a week and still feel like I'm not caught up. Maybe some of you feel like that in your work. But I would keep the Sabbath. Sundays was always a struggle. Do I just have a day to play recreation? Do I have a day to work on my house? Or do I go into the office to get caught up on work? And usually that's what I would do. So Sundays was always kind of a struggle. What do I do? But Saturday was never a struggle because it was a commandment. And because of that, it's a real blessing. Jesus knows that we need to recharge our spiritual batteries and even our physical batteries. That's what the Sabbath is designed to do. It's a day of refreshment. How many of you have been blessed by the seven-day Sabbath in your life? Amen. So let me just end with this quote from an author named Clifford Goldstein. I like how he describes the Sabbath. He says, in every religion, men revere something, shrines, cities, even people. They kiss holy land, their ears clutch the syllables of holy men. They immerse themselves in holy water, tangibles, touchables, holy things that they can see, revere, fill. In Genesis, however, the first thing declared holy is not a hill, a shrine, or a place, but a block of time, the seventh day. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. The word sanctified is translated from the Hebrew as kudosh, which means to set apart for holy use. Though creation dealt with the heavens, the earth, the birds, the sea, and the beasts of the earth, all things of space, it was time, not space, that God first pronounced blessed and holy. This action makes sense because besides space, time is the dimension in which God's creation, the heavens, the earth, the birds, the sea, and the beasts of the earth actually exist. Also, if God had made one specific place holy, a hill, a spring, a city, not all people would have easy access to it. They would have to travel to worship there. But time comes to us instead of us going to it. Once a week at 1,000 miles per hour, the approximate speed at which the earth rotates on its axis, the Sabbath circles the globe. Arriving on one sundown, leaving on the next, the seventh day washes over the planet each week like a huge cleansing wave. We never have to seek it. The day always finds us. Meanwhile, holy cities can be burned. Holy people can be killed. Holy shrines can be looted. But time is beyond fire and knife. No man can touch, much less destroy it. Therefore, by making a special time holy, God has made the Sabbath invincible, placing it in an element that transcends any devices of mankind. Armies can sack cities, rulers can ban pilgrimages, but no military tank, no swirl of ink can keep away the seventh day. We can no more stop the Sabbath than we can the sunrise. God protected his memorial from the objects of space, which are vulnerable to men, by placing it in time, which is not. Finally, men can avoid holy things. They can hide from objects, people, places, but they can't flee from time. We can ignore it, be ignorant of it, even hate it. But the Sabbath always comes, and nothing, no one can stop it. Skipping over no man, yet beyond the destructive grasp of all, the Sabbath stands as the universal yet invincible memorial of God's work in making mankind. Framed in time, the most basic element of God's creation, the Sabbath, more than any other biblical symbol, points us to the essence of our existence, that we are the handiwork of God. 
Thus, as the prime symbol of our roots, the Sabbath tells us also who we are, why we are here, and where we are going, all in a mere 24 hours. I like that. If you love me, keep my commandments. So tomorrow night, we're going to be really doing part two. And I want to encourage you to keep an open mind. Maybe this is something new for you. Maybe it's something that your initial reaction is to want to disagree with and think, well, why are, all the, why are so many Christians keeping Sunday? And that's my day. That's the day I grew up with. That's the day I cherish. And so I want to encourage you to come back because we're actually going to examine and look at all the texts having to do with the first day of the week. We're also going to be looking at many of the um, many quotes from actual leaders and publications from the Sunday churches about what they think about the Sabbath. I think you'll find it really instructive and eye-opening. So I want to encourage you to be here tomorrow at 6.30. So let's go ahead and pray, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for creation, where this world began, and that you handcrafted each one of us here in this room tonight. You made each of us special, different from everybody else. And Lord, the Sabbath tells us that we're pretty special to you because you want a whole day that we honor you and worship you and free ourselves from the cares of this world. Thank you for this blessing, Lord. I pray every one of us would learn more about it and take advantage of it. Be with each of my friends tonight as they travel home. In Jesus' name, amen.